Bay Spring, and we, we are so glad you are here. Welcome to those that are joining us online. I know it's a, it's a holiday weekend, and so some people are out of town doing different things, been uh, probably spending some time with family. Um, as, I, as I mentioned a few minutes ago to, to those of you in here, I've, I've really been wrestling, uh, and, or I, I, th- I don't know if it's me wrestling with him or him wrestling with me. Um, and I'm always going to come out on the losing end of that. You know that, right? So the Holy Spirit's just been wrestling in my spirit. And I um, uh, wanted to, to kind of start off because it, these have been crazy days, have they not? I mean, just the last three, four months has just been really, really some crazy stuff going on. And so um, um, the, the introduction, Robert Browning wrote this years and years ago. He said, God is in his heaven. All's right with the world. Okay, I love the quote, but I often wonder where was Robert Browning when he said that quote. Because as we look at reality, we have to question Browning. Because God is in his heaven. We know that for sure. But I got to tell you, all is not right with the world. It's just not. Um, and since the beginning of time, the world has known strife, it has known chaos, it has known craziness. And, and I think that, the, you know, we are living in this time, this day and time, and so this is our turn to be a part of that chaos and craziness, but it just feels weird. But, but it's also, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, it's there in your notes, it's coming up on the screen. It says, if any part of the body suffers... The whole body suffers. We read read that passage there in 1 Corinthians. And this morning, I I just got to tell you, the body is suffering right now. The body is suffering, and our nation is suffering right now. So I want to talk together, and, and, and I just want this to be a little family meeting this morning, if that's okay with you guys. You guys good with that? Just a little family meeting this morning to just kind of talk about this as we gather together this incredible 4th of July weekend to celebrate our country's 244th birthday. Isn't that amazing? That's an amazing thing. But, but what I want to do as we talk about that this morning, I want to do so with a little bit more intentionality than maybe I ever have before. All right? Because, um, and I want to ask a question. What is the 4th of July? You know, just ponder that in your mind for a second. Think about it. Uh, it's, 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 it's obviously the celebration of the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence was, was signed on uh, July 2nd, 1776. It finally came into, into everybody officially adopting it on July 4th, 1776. And, um, and, and basically what the Declaration was talking about, it was, it was talking about freedom. It was talking about freedom from the tyranny of Great Britain. And so we have, we've kind of, as a country, taken that and we've run with it like crazy. And, and, and yesterday, um, maybe in a little bit different way, but sometimes 4th of July celebrations can be monstrous things. All right? They, they weren't necessarily yesterday, but um, there, there's fireworks, there's cookouts, there's parties, there's all, all kinds of things going on. Um, my, my, my puppy, Kylo, had his first experience with fireworks last night. And I got to tell you, he did not like it. He did not. I, I, I thought it'd be fun to just take him out in the midst of everything that was going on, walked out the side door, and there's things blowing up in the sky, and he just wanted to run. And, and he was pulling me around. I, I got to get out of here. I got to get. And so finally, he just ran to the door and like, I got to get back in the house. And so I took him back in the house. And for the next two, two and a half hours, he did not shut up. He just barked and barked and barked and barked because the fireworks freaked him out, okay? So we, we enjoy those types of experiences. However, and this is where I was wrestling with God this week. The Independence Day that we celebrate does not have the same meaning for everybody. Matter of fact, this morning I want to throw some things at you. Because to the slave, as Frederick Douglass, he famously said, it is a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. 
To him, Douglas continued, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty and unholy license. Your national greatness, swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciations of tyrants, brass-fronted imprudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and your hymns and your sermons and thanksgivings with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disagree a nation of savages. That's some intense stuff, folks. And let me tell you something. This was not said last week. This was a statement that was said in 1852. And it was 11 years later that the Emancipation Proclamation came into being. That document that said the slaves were to be freed. But it was two years later, finally, when it got to the, the, the final announcement, came to then remote Texas in June 19th. 1865. And praise God, I got to tell you something. Slavery was done. Or was it? Or was it? I came across this email recently from a pastor friend of mine that I want to read verbatim. Because I read it, I listened to it, it broke my heart. It came from a couple who was part of his church, a rather large church, and he, he has been walking them through the things that we have seen happen in the last few weeks. And the couple sat down and penned him a letter as he was trying to help them to make sense of everything, which is hard to do, by the way. Hispanic wife, black husband, and this is their letter, unedited. The recent days have weighed heavily upon us. The things that have happened are so painful and sad, it has reminded us of the many injustices that we have already suffered. Things that we wish we could spare our son. For my husband, I can see it as most painful. His generation, I can see, feels as if hope is slipping by. I am younger than my husband, and I have been living with this injustice not as long as him. And I am tired. But we all know we cannot give up hope because of the children that will come of age. We cannot give up hope. I was once told by a white pastor when I asked how his church was dealing with a similar situation that happened years ago. And I was told that the church was a nonprofit and that he had to be careful not to mix politics. But yet he can turn around and talk about Christ while injustice continues. So that is why we have to do something. If the church is really what it claims to be, if it is really teaching to be more like Christ, we need to hear something. All around us are communities that children just simply do not have the same playing field. Where many in the church have the means to help their kids to succeed, they have the means to pay for tutors so their children can build up their resumes, so their children can have top-notch looking applications, where they can help write essays for their children on college applications, and on and on and on. And when a black or brown face gets some help to get to the next level, anger ensues. Yet generation after generation is always trying to catch up against the odds. And when a person of color complains, we are told that we are too sensitive. We hope Christians take pause and ask themselves, how many times have I turned the other way simply because it doesn't affect me? How many times have I clutched my belongings when I've seen a person of color enter into the elevator? How many times have I become anxious or on alert when a person of color drove through my neighborhood? How many times have I thought about calling the police because the person of color 
was sitting in their car. And I could go on and on and on and tell you all the ugly things that my spouse and I have faced. What will Christians do to make a change? How will we use our voice for change? What will we do to make our, a local kid have a better future? What will Christians do to ensure that kids that look like our son can walk without fear of a police officer approaching him? What will Christians do to be a voice? We have so much pain and sadness and could say more. But we thank you for the opportunity to share our feelings with you. Stay safe. And God bless you. Anybody else's heart broken by that note letter? Whew. So this morning, and you can obviously understand why I was wrestling with the Holy Spirit this week. How do we think spiritually? How do we think theologically and, and Christianly and, and biblically in this moment? Well, we treat this moment just like we do every other moment that we come across in life. And we must go to God's Word. All right? Because that's the only place we can go, and that's where we need to be. So we will go to God's Word this morning. Because there was a moment of national crisis for the nation of Israel. And there was great pain. And the question arose, as it does now for us, what is God looking for us to do? What is it that God wants from his people, his family of God? What is it that he expects from us? In the book of Micah, it's going to be there in your notes, it's going to come up on the screen. Micah chapter 6, starting in verse 6, we find out. It says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for, my, for the sin of my soul? Now here, here, if you'll notice what's happened here, that, that passage so far. What shall I give? What shall I give to God for my sin, for my transgression? How should we deal with this? And you see, it starts out, at, shall I give him a burnt offering, a, a calf that's a year old, thousands of rams, ten thousands of rivers of oil? Should I give him my firstborn? I mean, you can see it escalating up, right? And then there comes a beacon, not only for the nation of Israel, but for all of humanity. Look at verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? So here, we got to pay attention. He's talking to his people. God is saying to his people, this is what I require of you in these kind of situations, in these kind of circumstances. This is what I require of you. And here it is. To do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. All right? To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. You see, that is what we must seek to do with God's help. Now let's talk about this word justice for just a second. Because justice is a really, really important word. And it's a word that unfortunately often is used to kind of polarize people and politicize people in which there is an agenda that a person might be for or against. So we talk about this word justice but i gotta hear you, you you need to hear this this morning justice is god's word and it's a real important bible word justice all right because he says here do justice what does it mean to do justice when it comes to humanity in other words, and, I, and this is a great definition I came across, one should never treat others as if they have less worth than, than they do. One should never under-respect or demean other people. Okay, what a great definition for justice. All right? That is biblical justice. And the Old Testament prophets talked a lot about God judging and God, God dealing with people. And they particularly talked about widows and orphans and aliens and the poor. 
All right? They particularly talked about that. And so when you read through the Old Testament, you see those names come up again and again and again. Well, why is that? Because they were the most vulnerable to injustice. Being treated as if they had less worth than they did. And not only were they the most vulnerable, but they were disproportionately the victims of those injustices. And the people who perpetrated the injustice or enabled the injustice tended to just be totally blind to it. You know, like it was no big deal. Injustice was happening and people just put on blinders like, that, like it never happened. And that was, was what was going on. So God said, do justice. And then he says, love mercy. And let me tell you something about mercy. Mercy can't just sit on the sidelines. It just can't. I, 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 sometimes I my, will walk into a restaurant. My wife will see a, a person just, stand, just sitting there by themselves. And she has the gift of mercy. And she just can't sit on the sidelines. All right? She has to do something about it. She has to deal with it. She has to get involved. And mercy says if there is a hurt, if there is a pain, if there is injustice, I have got to be there. I have got to do something. All right? So the Bible says to do justice and to love mercy and then to walk humbly before your God. Now, let me tell you something about humility. Humility never gets puffed up. Humility is real open. Search me, O God, and know my heart. When's the last time you prayed that? When's the last time you just said, God, search me and know my heart. Reveal to me anything that's in there that's not good, that shouldn't be there, that must be eradicated. Reveal that to me, God. Here's what prides us. Pride does just the opposite. Pride says, I don't got that problem. That's not a problem with me. I, I thank God I'm not like that tax collector over there. Remember the Pharisees? Remember the story? Thank God I'm not like that guy. You know what that is? Pride 101. All right, that's what that is. It's always a scary posture for a person, especially, let me tell you something, folks, especially a religious person to take. Humility never does that. In humility, Paul says, we are to put the interest of others above ourselves. And of course, what did Jesus do? Jesus came and created humility above all the other things as a virtue that people just were blown away with in the world. So God, in his will, is to do justice, to love mercy, and to humble yourself before God. And folks, i got to tell you, this is the narrative of humanity. This is what God created human beings in his image to do. In the image of God, he created them male and female. Remember that? It's in the book of Genesis. Every kind, every people, every nation is of equal worth, of equal dignity, merits equal respect and equal treatment. And he intended us to live in oneness together, just as the Trinity does, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in mutual servanthood, in mutual delight and generosity. And the reality is, folks, that's how we were created. That's the way we are to live. However, instead of agreeing with Browning at the beginning of the service that all is right with the world, we would probably lean toward this little limerick that's going to come up on the screen and be more inclined to side with this guy. God's plan made a hopeful beginning, but man spoiled his chances by sinning. We trust that the story will end up in glory, in God's glory, but at present, the other side's winning. Kind of true, huh? 
Kind of true. And we kind of look at that, and we, I, I, I sense a little chuckle in some of your voices there. But deep down inside, we know, we know, we know, we know that what's going on in the world is not a laughing matter. It's just not. Man is not in every day and in every way getting better and better. So I asked the question again that, I, that the, the whole sermon is entitled, Is the World Out of Control? Is the world out of control? How should we view this present chaos? A wife said to her husband, Shall we watch the 6 o'clock news and get indigestion? Or should we wait for the 11 o'clock news and have insomnia? It's up to us, you know. Whichever way you want to go. Indigestion at 6, insomnia at 11. So whatever you want to do. I mean, honestly, should we sink into depression and despair? Or should, or should we do as many people just want to do? Ignore the world, ignore its news, and just kind of stick our heads in the sand, ostrich style? Is that what we do? Because this stuff really doesn't affect us? Oh, it does, folks. It affects us big time. Psalm 2 gives us the answer. And we're working in this series, Psalms, in, uh, in the summer, Summer of Psalms, however, I, I've entitled that, I forget, but anyway. Um, Summer in the Psalms, that's it. Thank you, Tensi, I appreciate that. Um, but in, in, in Psalm chapter 2, the author, who is King David, views the rebellion of the nations against God. And what is, what, by the way, let's just make this simple. What is rebellion? Three letter word? Sin. Rebellion is just sin, all right? Uh, it's, it's a fancy word for sin. When we rebel against God, we are sinning against God. So what we're talking about here is, 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 is sin against the nations toward their God, all right? And so that's, where, that's what David's coming, coming to look at, and he, and he reviews that rebellion. He looks at the chaos of the world, and, 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 and by the way, sin always brings chaos. You know that, right? It always brings chaos. And so he looks at the scene of his day, and he basically says, though the nations have belt, rebelled, though we have sinned as people, and we have sinned against God. Here's what you need to understand about God. God is still on his throne. God is still sovereign. And so here's the thing we've got to understand. Because we are sinners, because we have rebelled, because nations have done that, and that's what David's going to talk about here, we must turn to him because he is sovereign. And we must turn to him while there is still time. Because we're going to see in this passage that time eventually runs out. It just does. And so even though the world scene looks as if God is not a part of it anymore. That he's on some extended vacation. David shows us that God's plans have not failed. And they will not fail. Everything is under his sovereign control, and he will ultimately tri triumph as he has ordained to do. All right? So David appeals to the rebellious nations. And again, I don't want you to think of David ap appealing to just these abstract nations many, many centuries ago. I want you to understand as we read this passage, as we go through this today, David is appealing to us. Because the rebellious nations he's talking about are the rebellious sinners that we are. That's who he's talking to. And he wants to, uh, he, he appeals to them to bow before the Almighty God while they still have time. All right? So what we're going to do, we're going to spend some time right now. Let's read through Psalm chapter 2, uh, keeping in mind that this is what? This is our authority. It tells us what is good. It tells us what is right. It tells us what is true. It is the ultimate authority of our life. That is why we're here. And so let's read Psalm chapter 2. It says, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And we'll get back to that. What does that mean, against his anointed, in just a minute? Saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. In other words, let's just get rid of God. Let's get rid of his anointed. Let's cast them out. That's what verses 1 through 3 are talking about. All right? Verse 4, it says, He who sits on the, uh, in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. 
Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Verse 7. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Some of this sound familiar? Some of these word, this wording here? Okay. Ask of me. I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry. And you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And that's where we're going to end up today. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And that's David's final call to us. So for purposes of grasping the message, I want us to look at three different thoughts this morning as we look at Psalm chapter 2. Because first of all, in verses 1 through 3, we see the nations rebel against God. All right? That's, that's very, very plain. Look at this again. It says, why do the nations rage? Okay? And this is why I call the, this, this message, is the world out of control? Because this rage is the chaos. It's the out of control nature of the nations. Okay? Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? Why? Why do they do that? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Where? Against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. And so to understand the psalm, we have to first realize that on one level, there, there's a couple different levels in this psalm. On one level, it applies to King David. All right? Uh, the schemes of these rulers against the Lord and his anointed, because David was his anointed, remember that? Are rooted in a time in David's reign when some of the nations sought to rebel. David was king. Some of the nations said, we don't want to deal with you, king, and we're going to rebel. And they did. And so David is the Lord's anointed king over his people, Israel. And he writes this song to show the, the insanity, the folly of rebellion against God's anointed king because of the promises God had made to that king. God said, David, you're king. And these people rebelled against what God had told them. And David's saying, that's insanity. Why would you do that? That makes no sense. That's folly. And so on one level, these verses refer to those rebel kings and their attempts to shake off David's rule over them. Right? However, there's, ob there's an obvious undertone to this psalm. It goes far beyond just David's experience. It is ultimately fulfilled only in God's anointed. God's son. Who is, by the way, David's son as well. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Messiah. And so writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, because none of this had come to pass yet. David wrote this psalm, not only about himself, but in a deeper and much more complete way about the coming Messiah. And we know the coming Messiah was who? Jesus. So that's who, what this psalm is all about. It's about Jesus Christ. Thus, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he, 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 he pulls this out. And so these kings rebelled against King David. And that's what the psalm is talking about. But just as they rebelled against King David, so all men also rebel against King Jesus. You know that's true, right? They rebel against King Jesus. And so the Bible says, well, why, why do men rebel? Well, let's talk about that for just a second. Because the core problem that we are dealing with here is that word again, sin. It's sin. Let me tell you something about sin. Sin is anti-love. Sin is at the core of lovelessness. Sin is anti-justice. 
Sin is anti-mercy. Sin is anti-humility. It's not just about breaking rules. It's not about God having unreasonably picky and high standards. Sin, and this is the truth of it, is a spiritual force. It's a spiritual force. It goes all the way back to Genesis. We see in it two brothers, Cain and Abel. And Cain decides, as we all have done ever since then, because there's something in his heart. And he looks at Abel and he says, I don't like him. You ever done that to somebody? I don't like them. And what God says to Cain is very instructive. In that passage, God says to Cain, sin is crouching at your door. And it wants to have you. Did you notice that? Sin is crouching. Because that's what sin does. It hides. It crouches. It lurks. Because it wants to have us. That's what Satan does. In other words, sin is a predator. It wants to devour you. It is a force. It is a spiritual force. It is, an, it is spiritual energy. It is a living thing, folks. Don't kid yourself and say it's not. It seeks to devour and then it hides. It crouches at the door. It lurks in the shadows. It remains silently in the unseen places. That's the nature of sin. Sin will try to convince you that you don't have it. I don't have that problem. I can deal with that. You're just being sensitive. Don't, don't blow that out of proportion. That's not, that's not an issue with me. You know when you think like that? You think you don't have it? The fact is, it has you. It has you. It's that way. It's a predator. It hides. That's what we're dealing with. <clears throat> so let's talk about recent days. Let's just talk about it as a family. We come to this issue of racism. There's been a lot of talk lately about racism, hasn't it? A lot of talk lately. What is it exactly? Want me to tell you what it is? It's sin. It's sin. Bottom line, sin. You know what it is? It's a form of anti-love. It's a form of anti-justice, of anti-humility. Paul says this. We battle not against flesh and blood, but against the authorities, against the rulers, against the powers of this dark, and dark world and spiritual forces that are in high places. That's our enemy, folks. And they battle for Jesus for supremacy. In this world. Now, i got to tell you something. Jesus is ultimately going to reign. We know that, right? We know that. He is ultimately going to reign. But for now, the powers of evil battle with him for supremacy over this earth. They are, what are, the, what are some of these thoughts? They, their ideas, their thoughts, their, their, their ideologies, their symbols, their, their language, their concepts, their images. They are spirit. They are spiritual reality. And they battle with, Jim, with Jesus for supremacy in this world. This is racism. Racism is race-based lovelessness. Anti-love. And it is an especially heinous one. Okay? So when we're talking about this topic, Please, please hear me this morning. This is one of, part of the wrestling thing I was going through with the Holy Spirit this week. When we're talking about this topic, we're not talking about politics, folks. We're not talking about culture. We're not talking about ideology or sociology. Now, now please hear me. It permeates all of those things. It just does. And that's when we have to use our, our, our Christian faith to inform us about how we think about those things, all right? 
But that's not my job. That's not my area of expertise. My job is about the gospel. And let me tell you something. Racism goes way deeper into the gospel. It would put its roots down into the gospel. Racism is, deal, is kind of like dealing with a weed. Okay? What happens when you pull a weed, but you don't get the root? It comes right back, don't it? And that's what we have seen time and time and time and time and time and time. And time. We, we, we deal with the weed, but we don't get to the root of the problem. Okay? I can go out here this, this afternoon, I can pull all these weeds out of these beds, and by Saturday, I promise you, they'll be right back if I don't get the root out of them. All right? That's what racism does. So you've got to get to the root. Condoleezza Rice, brilliant woman, said that racism is the birth defect of our country. Let's get real honest about some things here, folks. When America was born, Europeans and Africans both came to this continent. But only one of them came in chains. And that raises a real important question. If you were here earlier, you saw um, quotes from some of our founding fathers. And those quotes were quotes about founding this nation on Christian principles. About having God as the preeminent one in this country. And we like to look back at that and we like to celebrate that. And we love to, we love to talk about that and think about that. A lot of these people who came to America were Christians. And they read their Bible and they, and they loved God. <clears throat> and here's the problem I'm having, folks. How could they own black people as slaves? There's a disconnect there for me. How is it possible for people who genuinely loved and sought after the things of God, they obeyed God, they prayed, they read the scriptures, they sought to be good parents, they sought to be good people. How is it possible that they could knowingly own and buy and sell people with black skin? And just because they had black skin. I thought about this, I've, 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 I've pondered about this. There's only one way. There's only one way. And that, that one way is that there had to arise a narrative somewhere. And maybe it started in Europe, I don't know. But the narrative was there wrong just as well as it was when it got here. The narrative was that, and by the way, this narrative is totally at odds. It was the enemy of God's story, this, this particular narrative. That all people were made equally in his image. That's God's story. To be dealt with with justice and mercy and humility. But this other narrative said that these people, the ones with darker skin, with black skin, do not bear... <clears throat> The image of God the way the people with white skin do. That's the narrative that arose, folks. You can't get around it. That black people are less worthy or less valuable or less intelligent or less competent or less beautiful or less refined. And white people are somehow more godlike and black people are not. And so... Along the journey, this hierarchical system was built, and somehow it became okay.
Now understand this morning, this is, this, and we all know this, this is not a superficial problem. It's just not. And we hear the phrase, white supremacy. And we think just about the clans and the rogues and the skinheads and the Nazis and the swastikas and, and all that stuff kind of like that. I got to tell you folks, no. Because this whispers to me My people, my norms, my tastes, my values, my ways, my appearance somehow, somehow bears the image of God <clears throat> more fully than theirs does? Can I be perfectly frank and honest with you this morning? I have, have. Haven't I been so far? That is a lie straight from the pits of of hell and I literally mean that again remember we've wrestled not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers of the air and this is a good one that Satan conjured up here folks let me tell you something it mocks Jesus it mocks everything he stood for It savages and it mangles and it distorts the church, his beautiful ultimate bride. And it gets into everything we see. Are we getting to the root yet? Are we down to the root yet? Because it's not about custom. It's not about habit. And it's not about politics. Although it informs all those and it must, it gets into our minds It gets into our thoughts. It gets into our eyes. It gets into our perception and how we view things. It gets into our mouths and stuff just comes out of our mouths that we, where did that come from? Why would I say something that insensitive? But it goes deeper. It gets into our educational system. It gets into our housing practices. It gets into our laws. It gets into our churches. And and folks, it gets into our hearts. I heard a story. A couple that came home one day, and they walked into their house, and it just stank. I mean, there was a horrible stench in the house. And that stench, no matter where they went in the house, it it was everywhere. It was, in the, it was in the carpet. It was in the, it was in the, it was in the clothes. It was, in, it was in everything in the house. And what had happened was a, was a family of skunks had gotten into their duct system. And when skunks do what skunks do, it literally penetrated everything. All right? Sin is that way. It gets into everything. This issue of racism is that way. It gets into everything. Folks, let me tell you something. I love law enforcement. But this issue has gotten into that. I love the church. But this issue has gotten into the church. I read this past week where a pastor in Mississippi kind of got up and Talk maybe like I'm talking to you guys this morning. And he never made it to the next Sunday. Because his church let him go. It, it, that, that's what I'm talking about. It gets into everything. And it's beyond human capacity. It doesn't mean we don't act. We must act. But we must understand what we're up against because it gets into everything. It gets into our hearts. It is real. It is sinful rebellion. And not just, that, that's, that's reality, but, but it's just one of many sinful rebellions that we have in our spirits. So you look at everything that's going on. 
and you say, where is God in all this? Did he go to sleep? Has he lost control? No, nope. the psalmist goes on to show that even though the nations have rebelled against God, God is sovereign and God's son rules. Look at verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and, and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of, dec- of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod and I- of iron and dash them into pieces. Look at verse, again, verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derisions. Um, the only place that you ever hear in the Bible that God laughs is right here. This is it, all right? Um, and, and, and by the way, that's not a laughter of delight. It's a laughter of derision, it says, the laughter of mockery. God is laughing at the folly, the crazy, the insanity of people rebelling against him. Understand something, folks. God is not afraid of people who oppose him. You th- we think so many times we've got to protect our God. He, he, he's not afraid of people that oppose him. He doesn't sit in heaven wondering whether he's, had, he's got enough on his side to combat, combat those who rebel against him. He doesn't send Gabriel down every once in a while to count the hosts of heaven to see if they ha- are enough to out- overpower the rebellious creatures on this earth. Then the psalmist says in verse 5, Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Understand, God wants those in rebellion against him to know that he has appointed Jesus as the supreme and sovereign king over everything. World leaders may think that they can abolish Christ and his God. You hear that all? uh, uh, How how long have they been talking about? We're going to get God out of everything. Is God out of everything? No. The leaders come and go. God stays in place. All right? And we see, we've seen that all, all, all the time. And, and, and the father just laughs at this rebellion. The father laughed because he is sovereign. And then the son rules. Okay? The psalmist now turns his attention to Jesus, and he begins by saying in verse 7, I will tell of the decree. So having been installed as king of kings, having been installed as lord of lords, Jesus will tell all those who are in rebellion against him and his father what the father has decreed. This is what the father has set down. This is what he has decreed. And by the way, what does it mean for the father to decree something? It means to determine it from all of eternity past. When God decrees something, it's going to come to pass, folks. You can count on it. And he said this, the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Here's what the Father had promised to Jesus. I will give you complete victory over all the nations. Remember when Satan took Jesus up on the mountain and said, Hey, If you just bow down and worship me, I'll give you all of this. Remember that? And and, and that's not even a temptation to Jesus. Why? Because it had been decreed before the foundation of the world that Jesus was going to have all the nations anyway. And that he would crush all those in opposition to the Father. Our task is to make the name of Jesus available to everybody. That's our task as the church. And we are to do so personally to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before our God. Whether it be with our families, whether it be in our neighborhoods, the ends of the earth, let each one of us be active in the mission of our church. That's God's plan. And we see that in these last few verses, God's call to the nations. You see, when we come to this last section, it's an interesting section. 
We are surprised by its tone. We have seen the nations rebel against God, but then we see God is sovereign and the Son rules. And one expects some kind of a statement of, uh, about the final destruction of those who rebel against God. But as we read this, these last few verses, that's not what we get. Instead, we get our gracious, loving God giving people the opportunity for repentance. And the psalmist writes in verse 10, now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Now, again, it's important to note here several things about this, about God's opportunity to repent. It's given by way of five different commands. Look at it there in the verse. He says, be wise. He says, be warned. He says, serve the Lord with fear. He says, rejoice with trembling. And he says, kiss the sun. That's kind of an interesting one, isn't it? God commands all in opposition to turn from their inevitable, terrible destiny and to be saved. That's what he's calling us to right here in this situation. And to kiss the sun in this context is a sign of submission. And allegiance. You see, in the ancient world, subordinate rulers would show their submission, their allegiance to their king by kissing his hand, by kissing his cheek. Showed his submission, his allegiance. And how gracious of God to give us an opportunity for repentance to any who are in opposition or in rebellion to him. So this morning, if you're in opposition, if you're in rebellion to God, he commands you to repent. He commands me to repent. And you may say, well, I'm not really in rebellion against God. Be reminded this morning that when you are indifferent toward the things of God, when you are indifferent to God's word, Newsflash for us as believers, we are in rebellion to God. When we know to do something and yet we choose not to do it, or when we know not to do something and we choose to do it anyway, we are in rebellion against God. And this passage says, repent while you still have time. And it goes on and says, lest he, lest who? the Son of God, lest he be angry and you perish in the way for his wrath is quickly kindled. In other words, you're not always going to have the opportunity to repent. So let's finish this up this morning. You can't find peace and safety anywhere in the world but only in Christ. World chaos will only increase. I mean, the reality is, the st and here's the thing, we, we think, oh, it's, it's never been this. Yes, it has. It's been this bad before. You know that, right? Okay? It just depends on what generation you're living in. We think, oh, it's get, it, it, it can't get any worse. It, it, it might. World chaos will only increase as the coming of Christ comes near. And if we can't escape it, what can we do? Well, the last line of the psalm is God's gracious invitation. Look at verse 12. The last phrase, it says, How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. I love our youth group's name, Refuge, because it's just such a cool thing. We find refuge. In God. In other words, don't run from God. You run to Him. There is no refuge from Him. There's only refuge in Him. And as we see the chaos in the world, we can only find peace and be blessed by taking refuge in God. 
You see, the early church took refuge in him by praying this very psalm as they first per- faced persecution. And, and, and in our troubled times, when it looks as if the enemy is winning, and sometimes today it looks like the enemy is winning, we can do the same. So we join the early church in doing everything we can to make Christ Lord of the nations. That's what this whole psalm is all about. Again, going back to my earlier comment, a cartoon shows a fearful couple huddled together in bed as they watch TV. And the announcer says, and that's the news. Good night and pleasant dreams. You ever felt, you felt like that lately? When you look at the news, you, you see the only way we can watch the news in this troubled world and have pleasant dreams is if we've taken refuge in our sovereign God. And we must remember what the Lord requires of us, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before the Lord our God. One final thought in closing, you guys, just to bring back some of the stuff we talked about earlier. I believe that when we saw, or or, uh, what we saw, at George Floyd's death, is that we saw it. We saw what we're talking about today. It usually stays hidden. Sin is crouching at the door. And it likes it that way. But in that video, which I don't think it wanted to be seen, This evil, hellish, spiritual, demonic force showed its face. And unanimously, we were sickened. We were sickened and horrified because sin loves darkness. Evil loves darkness and hates the light. But I got to tell you something. Thank God for the light. That is why I believe that this is a moment of opportunity for all of us. This is a moment more so than I can remember for a long, long time. When people from all walks of life, all different divides, different politics, different ethnicities, different generational barriers, different whatever, They looked at that tape, and they heard those words, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And they were horrified. And this is a moment we cannot miss. We talked about the Emancipation Proclamation. There was a moment when slavery ended. There was a moment a few years back when Rosa Parks got on a bus and said, no, no, I will not give up my seat. And you know what happened? The world has changed. And this moment begins with us. Because when evil steps in and it shows its ugly face for the world to see, we have to at some point say, no. No more. Do justice. Love mercy. And humble yourself before your God. That's what we are called to do as the people of God. And may we do that with everything that's within us. Shall we pray? Father, we come before you this morning. And and Lord, we, uh, we thank you for your word. Because when we don't know what to do, we must make it a habit to go to your word. Because your word has the answers for what ails us in life. 
And Father, this morning I thank you for our church family. I thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Whether they be white skinned or brown skinned or black skinned, Father, I just thank you for the family that you have called us to. And may we live in a unified way, in such a way that, that the world knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have redeemed us. Now, we're not perfect. We don't claim to be. But Lord, we, may we take this text this morning and, and do justice and love mercy and walk humbly before you today, Lord. Father, we thank you for this nation we live in. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to get it right. So may we go about the business and do that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to ask uh, you guys to go ahead and come up for the offering, please. Thank you guys for being here this morning. Thank you guys, that, those that are joining us online. Uh, the address for PayPal is behind us as we get ready for our offering this morning. And uh, we just want to thank you again for the opportunity to, to come into your homes, those of you that are, that are watching online, for those of you that are here. Again, thank you for, for taking your time out of this busy, busy weekend that some of us have and, uh, and uh, be here to worship God. You guys go ahead and take the offering up, please. Thank you.